So good morning uh, to our members in the US and good afternoon to our members in Europe and anywhere else in the world. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, the transatlantic race to zero emissions, the opportunities and implications of hydrogen on mainstream businesses. Um, at this point, I would like to ask everyone to be on mute. My name is Marcel Schultz and I'm the executive director of the European American Chamber of Commerce Netherlands. My colleague, Erin McKelvey, director of the ESC chapter in Texas, and I will be your hosts. For those of you not yet familiar with the EACC, we are a network of eight chapters, three in Europe and five in the US, and in total we serve close to 1,000 member companies. The EACC is a non-lobbying and non-profit organization. Our main objective is to stimulate business development for members and to facilitate networking and relationships between European and American businesses and professional organizations. Today's topic ties into both strategic and geopolitical discussions at senior government levels and to debates taking place in company boardrooms concerned with making choices and investments for their day-to-day -day business in order to keep up with the energy transition. Our audience today reflects both corporate stakeholders in the US, Europe and the rest of the world as well as many officials from governments, embassies, and consulates. We'd like to thank our ESCC Texas and Netherlands members at Houthof for working so diligently with us to shape a program on this topic, resulting in an expert panel, including Houthof, Erlikiet, and Port of Rotterdam. Finally, we find ourselves in the qualified hands of Jennifer Warren to steer this conversation so that in the next 60 minutes, you will hopefully have a better understanding of what hydrogen will mean for your organization. Aaron will now introduce our panel and I wish you a wonderful program. Thank you for the introduction, Marcel, and welcome everyone. We are using Zoom meeting today, which makes you all more visible. However, we kindly ask you to remain on mute. We will allow for Q&A at the end of the program and ask that you type your questions into the chat box on your screen. This program is being recorded and will be available on the EACC YouTube channel in the next day or so. We'll send a link out to all those who register. Please note that all comments and opinions presented by our speakers are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the European American Chamber of Commerce or its members. I will now introduce the panel and our moderator. Gertjan Tenkata, based in Houston, Texas, is Vice President, Large Industries Business Development for North America with Air Liquide. Air Liquide, present in 78 countries, is a world leader in gases, technologies, and services for industry and health. In his role, Gertjan is responsible for leading all business development activities for large industries within the North America cluster. Nico Van Duren, Director, New Business for the Port of Rotterdam, is responsible for the program on energy transition for the port and projects such as development of carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, bio-based chemistry, renewable energy, and sustainable transport. With 300 lawyers worldwide, Houthoff is one of the largest law firms in the Netherlands. Kirsten Berger is a corporate partner at Houthoff Netherlands, where she specializes in energy law and has extensive experience in the energy and industrial sector. Mark Van Bug is counsel at Houthoff Netherlands covering energy and M&A. Mark specializes in energy law as well as energy and industry projects. Our moderator, Jennifer Warren, was recently labeled one of the best energy journalists in the US by DCEO Magazine. Her areas of expertise include energy trends, their economic and geopolitical implications, and resource sustainability issues. She is principal of Concept Elemental, a strategic communications consultancy, focusing on energy and sustainability themes, thought leadership, and creative trends analysis. Jennifer, welcome, and thank you for agreeing to moderate today. Thank you, Erin, um, very much and Marcel as well. Um, thank you for your in introductions and welcome everyone. This is a really amazing group of experts and an equally impressive audience. The subject of the energy transition is vast and breaking it down into an energy source like hydrogen is an extremely helpful exercise. 
It feels like a historic time for the energy systems of the world with the two most advanced energy blocks presenting different realities, but some common vision. The horizon of this transition keeps shifting and more recently is the push to net zero and it's driving investment in new and different ways. Here in Texas, we're the largest producer of oil and gas in the United States. Entrepreneurs are largely responsible for this after two sequential shale revolutions, one in natural gas and the next in unconventional oil. So the US finds itself in a slightly different conversation than that of Europe. Europe's net zero ambitions are more advanced than those of the United States. The EU is working out how to reduce carbon emissions in a more granular way and innovation incentives and what firms will do matter. The investment case for energy sources, both traditional and emergent are in flux, but we're here, we're fortunate to have experts that can talk about Europe's energy transition and have insights about the US. Hydrogen's been receiving great attention as firms, analysts and policymakers try to assess the energy mix of the future. Our experts will provide overviews for us and then I'll post some questions to each. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat area and we will begin. Uh, Garrett, over to you. Thanks, um, Jennifer, and let me uh, allow me to quickly pull up a couple of slides to, uh, to help me do my introduction. So first of all, uh, I wanted to thank the uh, EACC and Houtel for organizing uh, the webinar today and inviting me as our speaker. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you virtually today. And I'm also happy and, and very honored that we're joined by the Port of Rotterdam, uh, a very important partner for Air Liquide in the Netherlands. Um, we already, in the introduction uh, gave, that Aaron gave, we already briefly mentioned Air Liquide. So I, 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 I won't say too much about the company other than we're a large international company and present all over the world, very active in, uh, in the hydrogen market amongst other things. Um, but maybe a word on hydrogen first. Uh, Air Liquide was one of the, the founding members of the Hydrogen Council, a CEO-led initiative starting with uh, maybe a, a, only a handful of companies in 2017, I, I think about 10 or 13 companies. But now uh, over 130 companies, large companies across the world are united in working together and fostering the development of hydrogen. And it just shows how much has happened in the last couple of years on this topic. And when we translate that into Air Liquide's uh, uh, ambitions, we were the first company in our industry to announce far reaching climate objectives. So we are actively working to reduce our carbon emissions by 2035 and uh, working on a pathway to reach net zero in 2050. So all of this in line with the, the Paris uh, uh, Climate Agreement. And Amongst others, we intend to reach this by heavily investing in the new hydrogen economy on top of all the hydrogen customers that we already serve today. And maybe as a last picture, but for the audience, um, and, and we'll go into more detail later, but, but hydrogen is not new uh, for us as an industrial gas company. Um, we have extensive pipeline systems, both in the US and in the Benelux as examples here, because that's where most of our audience is today. Uh, just to show that we are already a large producer and distributor of hydrogen uh, through, uh, through our pipeline systems. So I wanted to leave it there for the introduction and, um, and give it back to you, uh, Jen. Um, Nico, um, it's your turn for your overview. Yeah, thank you um, uh, to the EICC and, and Houto for uh, organizing this, uh, this meeting. And I will also give a short introduction and share some, uh, some slides to, uh, to underline my words. And I'll start with this slide, which presents a bit of an overview of the Port of Rotterdam. And I think it's, it's, it's good to mention some of the, the numbers that are here. I won't go through all the details, but um, what is important, I think, is that the Port of Rotterdam is an energy hub for, uh, for Europe. And um, today, Roughly one third of Germany's energy passes through the port of Rotterdam. And this is mainly uh, today, it's, it's coal, it's, it's crude oil, and it's all kinds of uh, hydrocarbons. And 
what is interesting, I think, is to, to, to see really the relation between uh, the Netherlands and, and Texas is that roughly 10, maybe even 15% of this uh, crude oil comes from uh, the United States. And with this, I think that today in the current energy system, you already see that there's a strong link between the two well, areas in the, in the world. Uh, lately, we've also seen that a lot of LNG uh, changed their destination from, from Asia to, uh, to Europe, given the, the current uh, energy situation. Um, now, if we go to, uh, to our strategy and then uh, the focus on to hydrogen, what we're working on is that we have an, uh, an ambition to reach a minus 55% uh, of carbon dioxide emissions in 2030 and um, heading to CO2 neutral in 2050. We do this by developing uh, infrastructure uh, in our first uh, domain, infrastructure for hydrogen, for carbon dioxide and all kinds of uh, other infrastructures. In the second stage, we're working on the development of a new energy system. And this energy system is based on, on renewable energy from solar and from, from wind. The third part is that we are working on new feedstock. New feedstock being renewables, once again, but also bio-based and, and, and waste as a feedstock. And then where the first three take into account all kinds of developments around industry, the fourth is around sustainable transport. Now, the beauty of these four domains is that one thing really runs through them all, and that's hydrogen. So we have a large hydrogen uh, development plan. And this plan looks like, if you put it on a graph like this, and I'll start um, with the pipeline that you see on the, on the graph. We are developing now a hydrogen backbone through the port of Rotterdam, which connects the, the sites where hydrogen will be produced uh, will be imported with the sites where it's used. And these can be sites in the port of Rotterdam, but also it can be connected to the pipeline system as uh, John already uh, which runs through uh, the Benelux area. And we're also preparing new uh, infrastructure running all the way into North Australia, into Germany. As I mentioned that today, one third of Germany's in this energy passes through Rotterdam. We're also trying to have that in the, in the future again. Now, what is interesting is that this hydrogen, we can produce it in the Netherlands, but our projections show that we only can produce maybe 10% of what is needed. So 90% of what we will need as hydrogen in the future will be imported. And that's roughly the same as what we see today in the energy system. So if you look at this graph, you will notice that in the 2020s, Already, there is a hydrogen uh, market and hydrogen use in, in and around the port of Rotterdam. It's roughly half a million tons of hydrogens, hydrogen that is used every day, uh, every year. Now, what we think is that it might turn into a hydrogen market, which is roughly 20 million tons. And that's quite a lot. 20 million tons maybe doesn't say anything, but if I translate it into the ways in which you can transport uh, hydrogen, that could be done as liquid hydrogen, maybe not today, but maybe in the future. But it's roughly the same as 56 million tons of crude oil. And that's quite a lot, as if today uh, I already told you that 10 million tons of crude oil comes from Texas to the Netherlands. So 56 million tons of crude oil is quite a lot. You can transport hydrogen in different uh, forms, different carriers. Uh, this could be ammonia, this could be methanol, or this could be liquid organic hydrogen carriers all with their specific characteristics and pros and cons. Now, this is not just future. So if you look at the timetable that we're looking at, we see some developments taking place uh, at short notice. So we do see the development of uh, large-scale electrolysis, uh, where we are in the middle of uh, the process on uh, final investment decisions. And we think that it might be operational by 2023, 2024. And this means that at that time, we also need to have our infrastructure operational. So the pipelines in the port will be operational by the same time. And then maybe a little later, we will see first imports coming from all over the world. And I think that uh, this also could be a connection between Texas and, uh, and the Netherlands and our part of Europe to see these kinds of flows starting to take off.
by the middle of uh, this session. With that, I will uh, leave my uh, with end my introduction and happy to discuss further on in, uh, in this event. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Um, so, Mark, it's uh, your time for your overview. Thanks very much. Um, if we could skip to the, the next slide, please. First of all, many thanks to the uh, EACC for, for organizing this, uh, this meeting. Um, honored to be speaking with you all today, uh, together with, uh, with Air Liquide and uh, the Port of Rotterdam. Um, what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just set the scene, uh, mostly from an EU perspective, but to start with, to give you a brief impression of where we stand and why we're talking about hydrogen today. Um, this slide illustrates the uh, annual greenhouse gas emissions from the world's largest emitters. I consciously took a slide from 2019, pre-COVID era. Um, and what it illustrates is that the US and the EU together, so the orange bar in the bar charts and the, uh, the green bar in the bar charts together account for, and the percentages can vary slightly, but together account for roughly 20% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so in other words, there's, there's work to be done in reducing these uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And in the next few minutes, I'd like to give you uh, a brief impression of what the EU is doing in this respect and how hydrogen fits into uh, the EU's uh, greenhouse gas emission goals. Next uh, slide, please. So not too long ago, on the 11th of December, 2019, uh, the European Union proposed the so-called European Green Deal. Uh, the name, of course, is uh, borrowed from uh, the former US President Roosevelt's New Deal. Um, this European Green Deal is a roadmap of key policies and measures that the EU requires to achieve um, climate neutrality by 2050. That's the end goal. Um, in that context, the EU has proposed and in the meantime adopted Mark, you put yourself accidentally on mute, so we can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, where was I? <laughs> Green Deal? Um, is a roadmap of key policies and measures that the EU is taking to achieve its end goal, climate neutrality by 2050. Um, and these goals are uh, this goal and the interim goal of reducing carbon emissions um, by 55% uh, by 2030 are enshrined in the so-called European climate law which takes the form of an EU regulation um, and which entered into force on the 29th of July, 2021. That was uh, followed by the so-called Fit for 55 package or packages, I should say, because the Fit for 55 package is in effect a set of uh, European legislative proposals. The first 13 of those were presented in July last year, and uh, the second batch was presented in December 2021. For us today, that's the most relevant package and the most recent one, uh, because it is the package that relates most to hydrogen. Both uh, parts of the package are aimed at achieving the interim goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030 compared to the 19, 
90 levels. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a graph briefly illustrating uh, the goals I just mentioned. If you look at the, um, the, the, the bottom dot on the, uh, uh, at the, at the bottom right-hand corner of the graph, you see the end goal, climate neutrality by 2050, and the uh, minus 55% interim goal is uh, slightly higher up on the graph to the left. So hydrogen at present is, uh, as was mentioned already, largely produced using fossil fuels, in particular uh, natural gas, but it can also be produced uh, without CO2 emissions in the form of blue hydrogen, where hydrogen is produced using carbon capture and storage technologies, or uh, green hydrogen, where hydrogen is produced using renewable sources. And this is where hydrogen fits into the EU goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the EU's hydrogen strategy was, was published in July of 2020. And in essence, it aims to increase the share of hydrogen in final energy consumption from less than 2% today to 14%, 1-4% by 2050. Now, in the short term, that means increasing electrolyzer capacity to six gigawatts uh, and producing 1 million tons of green hydrogen, mostly for existing applications. So the, the chemical industry where hydrogen is largely used as feedstock for fertilizers. In the medium term, so 2025 to 2030, the idea is to scale up electrolyzer capacity to 40 gigawatts, produce more, i.e. 10 million tons of green hydrogen to also accommodate other industries such as energy intensive industries, Think of the steel industry as an example and uh, heavy transport. And the end goal 2030 and beyond is to deploy hydrogen at a large scale um, leading up to the, the uh, increased share of hydrogen in final energy consumption of 14% by 2050. Final slide, please. So the recent second part of the Fit for 55 package launched in uh, December 2021 contains, among other things, two um, legislative proposals uh, relating to both uh, natural gas and hydrogen. One is a regulation um, which applies without having to be transposed into national law, and the other is a directive which uh, does require transposition into nat national law. And uh, these proposals are fairly extensive, but the highlights one could say are that they introduce definitions for both the blue and the green hydrogen that I mentioned earlier, uh, where green hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, as it's also called, is derived from renewable sources other than biomass and has to achieve a 70%, 70% greenhouse gas emission reduction compared to fossil fuels. Blue hydrogen or low carbon hydrogen is uh, derived from non-renewable sources, so fossil fuel sources, and also has to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 70% compared to fossil fuel-based hydrogen. These definitions are of course important to industry and um, so that they know what they have to cater for and for um, uh, parties that are involved in uh, innovation. Another important aspect that uh, is covered by 
the legislative proposals are unbundling obligations. The idea is that the production and the supply of hydrogen has to be unbundled from the transport of hydrogen. So there have to be separate entities taking care of production and supply as compared to transport. And hydrogen network operators are required to be legally and organizationally independent from gas or electricity network operators. Finally, the premise is that hydrogen network operators, but also storage facility operators and terminal operators involved in hydrogen are required to offer their services to third parties on a non-discriminatory basis, um, which applies to all third party network users. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm going to pose a question for each of the speakers um, and maybe they just contain their comments to a minute or two max, because um, then I've got a couple other questions and then we'll have some chat questions, hopefully. Um, Garrett, um, now I know Mark spoke a little bit about uh, green and blue hydrogen, but could you, from your perspective, just kind of give a, an overview of the hydrogen's role in the current energy mix as a few fuel source and also within the context of these shades, um, green, blue, and gray? Sure, yep, thanks, uh, Jennifer. I'd be happy to, and I'll, I'll try to be, uh, I'll try to be short, but uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, hydrogen is not new. Um, if I just look at our liquid, we have probably have 40 years of experience in producing hydrogen and transporting it. Um, we have a, a, a dozens of large facilities across the world, so do our competitors uh, to produce hydrogen. We have, as I mentioned, hundreds of miles of pipeline uh, just here in the US and in, in the Benelux alone to transport pure hydrogen to, uh, to our various customers. There are ways to transport hydrogen by truck, either in gaseous form or, or liquid form. And uh, when, even here in the US, uh, Air Liquide has proven that you can store hydrogen safely underground because we've actually built the largest uh, hydrogen storage cavern in the world here, just uh, a few miles east of, of Houston in, in Beaumont. So all of this is not new. Um, so what is it used for? And, and I, I think Mark quickly uh, mentioned some of the things as well. Roughly half of the, the hydrogen produced today uh, goes to the fertilizer industry. So it's captive use. Uh, it's, it's, it's used to produce fertilizer uh, in different places across the world, mostly in, in, of course, also in Europe and in the US. And the other half is, I think, what we uh, used for uh, mainly transportation fuels. This started, what is it, 20, 25 years ago, also regulatory driven with the desulfurization of fuel. So the, the need to have uh, more stringent fuel specs drove the use of hydrogen to take sulfur out of the fuel. And in the later years, uh, as, as uh, uh, the quality of oil that we get out of the ground changed, there is also a need to use hydrogen for cracking. Um, and that kind of drove that market and when, when we look at the, I think the latest use of hydrogen in the, in the total mix as a, as, a, as a feedstock, it is predominantly for uh, renewable diesel production. So when you uh, uh, um, convert uh, vegetable oils into renewable diesel, you need hydrogen. And that has been the, I think the latest growth market of, uh, uh, for hydrogen, for, for this type of industrial hydrogen. All of it, or I would say 95% of the hydrogen produced today is probably gray. So uh, very traditional uh, production using natural gas and then producing gray hydrogen. And uh, when I look at the US and, and Europe, I think the markets are very similar. So same type application, same type of customer, same processes driving that growth at the moment. I hope that uh, clarifies the, or answers your question. Thank you, Garrett. Um, Nico, um, I, and you covered it somewhat in your presentation, but 
Can you just discuss quickly how the Port of Rotterdam is looking at hydrogen within the energy mix and sort of its, its build out for the future energy systems? Yeah, um, I, I touched on it in the presentation, that's, that's true. Um, but what we are looking at is to, to really change the energy system of, of the Port of Rotterdam and, and a lot of its um, connected industries in, in the Netherlands and in Germany. And the way in which we try to do it is to have a look at uh, electrification of industry, electrification of transport. But we can't do everything with, uh, with power. Uh, so what we need is also hydrogen as an energy carrier. And for instance, we, we did have a look at how much uh, renewable power would we need if we were to electrify the whole uh, port of Rotterdam. And then we would need 200 gigawatts of uh, renewable power, being offshore wind or solar or whatever. And there is only place in the North Sea area for 60 gigawatts of offshore wind. And this 60 gigawatts will be used by the whole of the Netherlands, not just the industrial area. So therefore, uh, we come to the conclusion that you need to find other areas around the world where there is renewable energy available, be it uh, hydro, solar or wind and this could be areas in, in, in the northern parts of the Netherlands in, or of the world in, in South America in uh, Australia where you have good conditions for solar and wind but then you need to transport it and that's where hydrogen comes into play uh, because then you can make hydrogen in other places of the world uh, make renewable power in other places of the world convert it into hydrogen and then transport the hydrogen in a carrier form to the Netherlands and by that means, hydrogen becomes really important in the energy system. Um, maybe one of the most important energy barriers for the, for the future. Thank you, Nico. Um, uh, Kirsten, um, just a brief comment about the Netherlands' role in the European goals on developing a hydrogen economy. Yes, sure. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Um, I think all, all the countries are actively looking uh, at hydrogen at the moment, uh, and the Netherlands has a very clear ambition, and that's to become the hydrogen hub. Uh, as Nico already mentioned uh, twice, I think, uh, the, the, the Netherlands today is already an energy hub, uh, and we clearly wish to maintain that position. Uh, and as a country, we have a very good starting position uh, because of the existing infrastructure, which is very extensive in our country uh, due to the well already existing gas infrastructure. Uh, we have the large ports, which are necessary for import, as also mentioned by Nico. Um, then on, in addition, we have an already existing hydrogen market because of the industry is already using hydrogen at a large scale. Um, and we have a strategic location, not only due to the ports, but also because of Germany being uh, literally the hinterland uh, with a very large market as well. Um, and lastly, we're also looking at a very large expansion of our offshore wind capacity, which, as Nico mentioned, is not enough to fully electrify or uh, provide for green hydrogen possibilities, but it's definitely an additional element. So I think that's clearly the ambition of the Netherlands. Yeah. Great, Th thank you for your comment. Um, there's a question in the chat and it kind of relates to something that I was gonna um, throw out to any of our speakers. Um, so I think we'll get to that and then circle back to a couple of other ones about um, per perhaps the US point of view, like how the US is gonna come out with this. Um, so this question and maybe uh, Garrett, maybe you jump in on this one. So. How do you see hydrogen's prospects playing out if natural gas and nuclear become green investments in Europe? And also given the recent energy shortages dilemma, because someone was asking about the energy shortages. So kind of tying it to what's happening now and, and, and some of this movement. <laughs> no, it's, it's a very good question. When um, I, I was just looking up some, uh, some uh, studies from the Department of Energy and, and the way they look at hydrogen developing in the US. So first, when we look at the US, I, I think the, the, the main expectation is that hydrogen will play a role in mobility. So in, 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 in trucking, heavy duty trucking and, and other forms of mobility. That is where the US, the Department of Energy expects the major growth for, for domestic hydrogen consumption in the first couple of years. 
with maybe later uh, growth in, in the energy system, but it's not expected that it will happen very soon. However, uh, what we do see when you look at the, uh, as you mentioned, energy export, I, I think it's, it's being recognized and it's, it's literally a, a change in the last 12 months. A lot of the DOE studies were from 12 months ago. When you look at the market today and the opportunities we see here in the US, a lot of it is indeed starting to focus around the export of hydrogen in some form, whether it be blue ammonia or through other types of carriers. And, and I think the US is starting to realize that based on our natural gas, uh, uh, vast resources, and also the ability to execute carbon capture projects much more easily here in the Gulf Coast than for instance in Europe, that it could be a, could be a strategic element in how they uh, uh, develop their energy system for, for export towards Europe uh, specifically, and maybe also towards Asia. Does anybody else want to add anything about the um, current energy shortages and just kind of hydrogen and, and the energy mix? It, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe a remark, Jennifer, on, on the, the nuclear power, um, if, if that will be qualified as green. I, I don't think it has an immediate impact on, on the hydrogen developments uh, because it, it would be very helpful for electrification purposes, but not so much for using hydrogen as a gas. Right. Um, so a question to, that was sort of posed to uh, Garrett and Nico is um, the policy initiatives in the US and the projects that are in development kind of help inform our understanding about how hydrogen may evolve in this transition. Um, what can you say from your respective point of views with this? Sort of what you see in terms of developments and, and um, um, how it relates to the U.S. So, yeah, so starting with the U.S. and um, maybe apologies to bring another slide, but it maybe talks a bit easier for, for the audience. That's the one thing I, I wanted to share because I'm, I'm not really sure how much this is explained in the news in Europe. Um, there are a number, two specific pieces of legislation that have been floating around in the U.S. Uh, um, uh, to, to uh, start accelerating the development of clean energy. And um, the, 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 the piece of legislation that was actually passed in the September, October timeframe here in the U.S., so it's current law, is the Infrastructure Investments and Job Act. It, it's, for, for me, a mind-boggling amount of money uh, uh, that is being deployed to uh, accelerate the development of clean hydrogen in the US. So specifically what they call at least four hydrogen hubs are, are being uh, proposed to be developed. So various geographies in the US, whether it's the Gulf Coast or California or the East Coast, uh, uh, governments and companies are coming together to form an idea of what such a hub might look like for large scale hydrogen production, applications for mobility, uh, et cetera. Um, and the other big element of it is the uh, substantial investments in carbon capture. So overall, roughly, I think $6 billion is being made available to kickstart the development of carbon capture. And as, as, a, as a Dutch citizen, but being based here in, in Houston, I, I think that is what, where I see the big distinction. Um, the tremendous amount of acceleration over the last 12 months, as you mentioned in your introduction, very entrepreneurial in here in, in, in Texas uh, and Louisiana specifically. And I would not be surprised if we see the first large scale CCS projects being uh, 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 put in the ground literally this year uh, to start up in two, three years from now. So from start to finish, it will take parties here in the US three to four years to get these projects off the ground. And I think as a result of it, as we were saying, Europe was, is clearly leading the debate on sustainability, but I think the US with these types of investment is catching up really, really quickly. Mm. And th then there's a second piece of legislation, the Build Back Better Act, that is still being debated in, the, in, the, in Washington. Uh, so not yet passed, uh, but also very strong pro provisions in the draft legislation around supporting hydrogen. Uh, with very important stimuli type uh, uh, tax credits to, uh, to promote the production of low carbon hydrogen. So if, if, if that piece of legislation will be passed as well, 
then uh, again, together, I think we'll see a tremendous acceleration in the next 12 months here. Yeah, so, so it sounds like um, because of the US's position with you know, oil and gas, the infrastructure that's existing, the Gulf of Mexico, you put together the entrepreneurial factor, um, money's flowing in. There's a lot of um, capital that wants to flow into cleaner energy. So, so yeah, you see this sort of um, all these forces converging. Um, so how is that, um, how does that differ in Europe? And Kirsten and or Mark, you may um, have a comment with some of the deals you see, how that relates you know, to this um, investment theme of, of, of money flowing to, towards more sustainability and hydrogen and, and the like. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's really different. Uh, I think I think the, the number of rules and regulations is probably different from the US. I think yeah. that's a standard distinction that everyone always makes uh, that in Europe things are only uh, allowed if specifically provided for by law and the US is the other way around. Everything is allowed unless forbidden by law. Uh, so that, that could accelerate uh, developments in the US. Uh, I think there are so many initiatives right now in Europe and, and also particularly in the Netherlands because of this, uh, this hub ambition. Um, and I think uh, Gerjan already mentioned that the Hydrogen Council, there are many similar corporations, uh, consortiums, uh, pilot studies. And, and I think uh, what's quite typical is that all kinds of parties are involved. So not only private parties, also uh, authorities, but also research institutions and looking together at the whole chain, because in the end, within the chain, everyone is dependent on everybody else. Uh, and what, what we see as a clear theme is the call for public support, both in the form of subsidies, but also in the form of clear regulations, which obviously have to be, well, have to take place at a European level. Um, yeah, just to add to that, yeah. uh, I think that uh, the, very briefly, the European Commission estimates that, you know, between 200 and, and 450 billion euros will uh, be invested in the hydrogen economy between now and 2050. Um, looking at the short term, the Netherlands has pledged to invest about 100 million in uh, euros in clean hydrogen. And some of the Dutch are jealously looking at neighboring countries such as Germany and, and France, where the um, amounts pledged to promote uh, blue and green hydrogen are significantly larger uh, in the billions rather than the millions. Uh, having said that, as Kirsten mentions, um, uh, there's a call for, for subsidies to um, promote both blue and, and green hydrogen uh, use and technologies. Um, and those are not included in the Dutch 100 million amount. So in effect, you could say that the Netherlands is uh, is also committing significant government resources to uh, to getting, you know, a, a viable uh, hydrogen um, uh, infrastructure off the ground. Um, and if, if I may, may add, and maybe make the connection between what uh, Gareth said and, and, and Mark and Kirsten, what is interesting is that uh, what you see now is that a lot of the developments in, for instance, Germany are around uh, demand development, whereas the uh, developments in, in, in the States, as I understand, are more like supply developments. So the interesting part is to really connect supply and demand. And one of the things that we need for that is certification of the, the, the hydrogen and, and certification of the carbon content of this hydrogen. And if we get that uh, work work out well, then we can see really see this this trade flow start start uh, starting to take off within I think uh, a couple of years. Already. So, what will this mean in terms of competition? You know, for um, you know these hubs and competition in terms of investment dollars. You know, um, like in in Europe, there's sounds like there's a lot of um, public investment that's gonna go towards this. There's some in the US, um, but there's also a lot of interest in capital markets, you know, private investment going into large firms that are gonna be large players. Um, how does anybody see, see those, those factors playing in this 
competition for the hydrogen economy and, and whatnot. You know, competition for capital, competition between like these hubs, you know, these four hubs you mentioned, like what will set things apart? Um, you know, is it is it the capital? Is it the policy? Is it is it for innovative firms? Um, anyone can jump in. It's a very good question. I'm not sure if, if I have, have, have a good answer for you, but what uh, what we see when we talk to our, our customers, and I, I, th I think Nico mentioned on a very important point, we can all produce hydrogen and that's great, but there needs to be demand for it. So uh, the, like an energy carrier is one thing, but at some point somebody actually needs to use the hydrogen for something. And um, when we look at the different types of hydrogen hubs that are being developed, I think uh, in the US, each has, has their own uh, specificity, their nuance. I, I think when we look at California, there is a very strong desire in Los Angeles and San Francisco to look at the mobility market. So decarbonizing the local uh, the heavy duty trucking, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when we look at the Gulf Coast, because of maybe oil and gas industry, we're looking at much more large scale low carbon hydrogen production for the, the energy environment or for power plants or those types of applications. And the Northeast has Northeast of the US has their own nuance again, again, more, more focusing on, on mobility and other type applications. So I think what we see here is each region kind of plays into their strength and will try and make the argument with the Department of Energy why, why their specific proposal is of course the best to, to accelerate the, the growth of hydrogen in the US. Um, there's a question here in the chat and I better get to, to one. Um, this is, um, the question is, um, ha, um, blue hydrogen is sort of an excuse for delaying rather than mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and why not just focus exclusively on green hydrogen, uh, since it needs more investment? Um, um, yeah. Anyone want to jump in on that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, what, what we see is that uh, we really do need both. Um, if you look at the, 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 the costs of uh, carbon dioxide reduction, uh, blue today is cheaper than, than green. So that, that's one. But the other one is that if you look uh, at green, we just need some time to really develop this at scale. Um, I, I, I gave you some numbers, uh, and I think the biggest electrolyzer today, which is operating, is about 10 or 20 megawatts. And you need to go to gigawatts. This simply takes time and, and, and needs time to, to develop. So the first uh, developments that we will see in the Port of Rotterdam coming operational in 2024 are 200 megawatts. And I think in Saudi Arabia, they are going one one uh, scale higher, but it still needs to scale and that takes time. And we don't have that much time in order to reach this uh, carbon dioxide reduction uh, targets. So we need to focus on blue and on green. That's how we feel. Yeah, I, I think Nico is absolutely right. I, I, um, I, I think we recognize that blue hydrogen is a transition technology ultimately, uh, but absolutely needed and available to be done in the next couple of years. Whereas if, you, if I look at the things we work on in the US and I, I, I think my colleagues in Europe as well, a lot of electrolyzer projects, but at some point it takes time to actually even produce the electrolyzers. There's a tremendous backlog in just getting your hands on the cells in order to get a project off the ground. So even with the ambitions of hundreds of megawatts or gigawatts of electrolyzers, it's gonna take years to actually start building the facilities who will build the electrolyzer. So all of that to say it's, it, that it is absolutely happening. And to your point, Jennifer, there's a lot of capital going into the type of development, but it's gonna take years. And in the meantime, blue hydrogen, we can more or less start today and start decarbonizing the existing infrastructure. That, that's how we look at it. And uh, thanks Nico for mentioning the largest electrolyzer in the world because it's actually Early Keats electrolyzer. Uh, and we started it up last year in Canada. So thanks <laughs> for mentioning it. Um, yeah, perhaps. Perhaps just, Jennifer, if I may, yeah. uh, just to add to that, um, even blue hydrogen, which indeed at present is, is cheaper than green and a realistic, you know, 
transition technology in terms of uh, clean clean hydrogen and absolutely necessary i think even that to get that off the ground uh, if we look at developments in the netherlands is um is not an easy task uh, one of the largest projects involving uh, blue hydrogen is actually one in which both uh, Air Liquide and the Port of Rotterdam are involved. It's uh, the so-called Porthos project named after the Musketeer. Um, and basically it consists of a, a pipeline which runs from the Port of Rotterdam industrial area, connecting various launching customers, including Air Liquide to a uh, uh, pipeline which will transport CO2 into the Dutch part of the continental shelf. So um, the pipeline will, will end uh, as a subsea pipeline and the CO2 will be stored in uh, depleted gas reservoirs. This is a, a large scale infrastructure project. And I think it's fair to say that um, without government support or at least support from entities which are wholly or partly government owned um, this project would have been uh, would not have been possible uh, or at least would have been very difficult to to get off the ground um, so i think in general that may apply to to more um, parts of the development of the, 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 the hydrogen infrastructure in any event in the Netherlands, but likely also in, in other European EU uh, countries. Government support, I think, is, is key, not only in terms of subsidies, but also in terms of actual uh, involvement. Um, one other question, because we're getting short on time, and, and so maybe a quick response. So the question is about um, the, the risk of the a different administration possibly in the US in a couple of years, um, might the government incentives be halted and therefore you know, put at risk some of the hydrogen investment ambitions? Um, could anyone comment on the changing flux of US politics related to hydrogen and, and its prospects here? Yeah, I, I can, I have to be very careful, but I can try provide some perspective. I think uh, when I just look at early Keed and our engagement with uh, uh, the, uh, the legislator, legislative people in, in Washington, we work with senators on both sides of the aisle. I, I think there's a fairly good amount of support for decarbonization on both sides. And, and despite uh, uh, maybe the, the current political environment in the US, I don't think uh, this is largely being disputed. Um, so I, once, I, I think it's a matter for us to get certain projects off the ground, but I don't think we're too concerned that the policy, policies will change 180 degrees and certain incentives will be pulled back, et cetera. I, we don't see that as the major risk at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have, does anybody else wanna say anything about that? Okay, we've got just a couple of minutes uh, left. I'll try to, uh, this is sort of a question about um, the practical uses of hydrogen. It's not easy to transport and store. Car tanks are heavy um, uh, with it. Um, what can we hope for in the developments in this field? I guess they're getting at you know, the transportation and usage elements. Um, and is there an expectation that the hydrogen Gen com, um, economy can develop like in the speed that the battery sector is, is going. Um, anybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, th th there's a lot to say about this uh, question. Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe too much uh, for, yeah. for one minute. One minute. Um, <laughs> We, we, we do see a lot of developments in, uh, in and around the, the, the carrier form of, uh, of hydrogen. Um, in my presentation, I think I mentioned uh, already four different types of transporting hydrogen. 
there are there are more to come which make it easier to, to transport the, the hydrogen um, so but but really it's it's too too uh, too difficult to explain it in, in just one uh, one minute yeah. maybe one thing around the, 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 the speed of development which you see in batteries if that's in the question I think we're at the start of the development around hydrogen so it will speed up and then it will yeah. catch up with the, the, the speed of battery development yeah maybe next time we'll do a, a master class in, in the hydrogen developments <laughs> and its uses <laughs> for another day um Aaron I think we're at time um I'm gonna shift it back to you and thank you everyone for your very insightful comments you're all amazing experts and um, we're very fortunate to have heard from you thank you jennifer um i think this was a great presentation we've had a lot of great comments in the chat box um <clears throat> appreciate everyone's time so i'd just like to say on behalf of the um, european american chamber of commerce Texas and Netherlands, I'll, and Marcel's got a couple things to say as well. Just thank all of our speakers, Gert Jan, Nico, Kirsten, and Mark, um, and Jennifer for this excellent and engaging program. Uh, we hope our guests learned more than they knew and had some good takeaways from um, the presentation today. So uh, the EACC Texas We'll continue to add new programs on our website and share information via our newsletter. We will be putting this recording up on the EACC YouTube channel um, where all of our presentations are from um, the network, both here and in Europe. And uh, we hope to see some of you at South by Southwest in Austin in March, where we'll share some space with the EU delegation. That should be fun. And Marcel, I'll let you wrap up. Thank you, Erin. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. And also a big, big thank you from uh, EACC Netherlands to all the panel, panel members uh, who have done an excellent job, uh, as well as to our members who factually make these post programs uh, possible. Um, in case you would like to be connected to one of today's participants, feel free to write us an email. We'll then forward your request. If you're not yet a member and would like to receive information on that, please reach out to Erin or myself. And finally, do stay in touch with your local chapter um, for, for information and on upcoming webinars and events. Our next program will be a fireside chat on February 60 with the former EU ambassador to the US, David O'Sullivan, on rebuilding the transatlantic relationship. Wishing you a nice rest of the day and looking forward to seeing you all back soon. <laughs>